Thank you folks for coming. Um, it, this presentation will be my first presentation in Open Source Summit, like ever, that got accepted. So it's good. Yeah, thank you for the clap. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's good to be here. Thank you for lending me your eyeballs for the next 30 minutes. I'll, I'll make good use of it. We're going to have some good laughs. And um, basically, when I started making this presentation, I gave this topic, but I didn't like it. So I'm just putting this up for the camera crew so they can put it as thumbnail. But the actual topic is like this one. And um, basically, I wanted to see Kimu as a way to, you know, sort of sidestep chip, sh chip shortage in general. We used it for that matter, and I'm pretty sure a lot of people use Kimu for different reasons. It's a great tool, a uh, great piece of kit. And that's what we are going to be talking about today. How do we use it for this one specific reason as an emulation? But um, this is going to be more of a refresher. I didn't make it as a 101 guide. So hopefully I can, you know, um, help everyone along as we go on this journey. But yeah, for introduction sake, I am Vipul and I work as a product owner and a documentation lead at Belina. You might have heard of Etcher. You use it for flashing Ubuntu or whatever distro you want on your pen drives, and it has been around for quite a bit of time. A lot of the community loves us. So Belina does Etcher and a lot of other things. And uh, I also write documentation for startups, mostly open source. I contribute to multiple organizations, online and offline, and I'm organizing recently uh, PyCon India as well as uh, Sustain OSS India uh, back home. And my pronouns are he, him, and this is the best uh, pronunciation for my name. It's V, pull. And um, we'll, be, we'll be pulling quite a bit of concepts today. It's, it's KVM, it's, it's uh, QMU, it's virtualization, it's TCG. W what is this? So we'll, we'll start with something familiar. This is Raspberry Pi. Everyone has seen this green board. Really the defining piece of uh, small-scale computing. It has everything. And turns out it ain't much but it packs quite a punch in terms of doing its use case wherever it's applied, right? But it's a very useful device. And uh, it's, it powers most of, of the world that we are living in. Um, satellites, underwater drones, smart dustbins, your talking speaker at home. Um, and, and so does the companies Bellina works for. Um, we build dice, we do management for Dyson backpacks, we do underwater drones, we do satellites. Basically, we do management of IoT devices. We don't build these solutions. People come to us for management. But yeah, as I said, like embedded is everywhere. And so, so is Raspberry Pi, so is Intel Nox, Jetsons. So when one person parks their ship wrong in a Swiss canal, we, we, we get a problem, like all of us together. We get a problem which, you know, we can't fix. Um, it's, it's a chip shortage. It's the supply chain issue. People can't get what they want. You and I want a screen to build like the hobby project next day and it's not coming next day. It's not coming next month. It's not coming this year. What do we do? How we mitigate that? How we mitigate this thing when a major company shuts down a very popular board? I know, I know what has happened. Like Asus is building it next. But these things do happen. Uncertainty still exists here. And how do we have solutions for that when things are not even in stock? I, I'm pretty sure in some of the countries, at least uh, back home, uh, things are recovering, but it's still very costly. And that's what we are living in the world. What's the solution? Is it a bird? It's a Pokemon? No, it's Kumu. Um, wait, I'm not full screen. One second. Where's my mouse? Come on. That's better. just doesn't want to go full screen. No worries. Uh, Linux, am I right? <laughs> um, right, right, right. So Kimu, right? Everyone knows this. Um, and a generic open source em emulator, virtualizer, has been around for two decades. People use it. People love it. People hate it. Um, has been released. Like The first patch I found out, like the p first patch is 0 .0 .10 in 2009. But actually, Febreze released the first one, like not open source, but just released it in 2003, actually. So it has been 20 years exact. And uh, it's supported in multiple architectures, 
everywhere, every architecture that we work on or will be working on in the future, risk five included, has support for Kim. Um, we are at least on to, you can see the second green column there where you can see TCG support for almost every architecture. And then you have hardware virtualization support for some of the popular ones. And this is good to see because when you're using Kimu as a tool, you can better believe you will get the support you need from the community, from Stack Overflow when you need it, and sometimes you know from your friends who already know this tool. So what really is Kimu? Like, sure, we gave out a definition, and the definition I like from Wikipedia is the is Kimu is a generally accurate, generally accurate, accurate. Uh, Wait, I have written it down because I've, I've, I knew I'd forget. Functionally accurate virtual Q emulation platform, that's Kimo. But what does that mean, right? As like, I'm doing an open ramp uh, conversation here with people. I'll start with a very good example. I love to cook. Meet Chef Kimo. Chef Kimo has been preparing dishes all the time. It's, it's, it's his job. And uh, here, the kitchen, is your computer. Chef Kimu is the, what, is the chef, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, customers are operating systems or applications that you're going to run in your kitchen, that you're going to serve food to, they're extremely picky. They're like the worst customers. Someone wants pasta, someone wants sushi, someone wants Indian food. How does Kimu serve everyone? The best part, Kimu has a special recipe book called a hypervisor. What is a hypervisor? A hypervisor is, something that it allows it to cook multiple dishes without having the actual hardware for it. Everyone wants different dishes, different hardware being used to present those dishes. But Kimu has something that, you know, that it can cook maybe Chinese food without a wok, uh, pasta without olive oil, sorry Italians. Um, and uh, like anything, it, it can magically transform to suit the eater's preference, the emulated hardware. So it can serve whatever dish you want. And picky eaters will be amazed because Kimu can satisfy anyone's cravings without even helping them realize they even have the hardware. No one in the restaurant knows Kimu is doing this. They are all oblivious of the fact, getting the food they need, getting the resources they need, in the hardware they need, emulated. In the kitchen, that is your laptop. Um, so in essence, Kimu is the master chef that makes your computer a versatile kitchen capable of satisfying the most diverse and demanding software taste buds, uh, all without require any specialized hardware. They never have to leave their envi native environment because they know they are never, they always knew they are in the native environment, but your kitchen is the native environment here. So hopefully this example helps, I don't know. I should have done it before lunch though. <laughs> Everyone feels hungry now. But with this kitchen thing, Kimu is overwhelming, man. It's like, it's tough. It's tough to get into. You know this place. What is this place? Can someone tell this? What is this? It's this conference hall. I was thinking of going to the fifth floor. I can't. It's a chamber of secrets here. You have to figure out which ladder to cross and you know which, which place to go. And that's what Kimu is. I was thinking all night about this. This example and this. I'm so proud. I came up. But yeah, Kimu. Kimu is like overwhelming for people who are starting up. It's tough to get in. It has a steep learning curve. But I can tell you, after this talk, hopefully, it will be good for you. It will be smooth sailing. You can have a refresher about what Kimo is, how to use it beyond the GUI that you have been using, and we'll, we'll make something out of it. Let's, the fun is over, or sorry, the boring slides are over now. The fun actually begins. How does it work? So when I learned Kimo six years ago, I saw AMD's, there's a, there a link I've posted here. I'll share you the slides. AMD did a thing about how does Kimo work. And I, I, I have been reusing this all the, all the time. It's screenshots literally from the video. So Kimu works in a way where, think about us building for an ARM device, right? So when we are writing code, we are writing for that ARM device, that code. We write for the target platform. We are using, li oh, we are using uh, libraries for the target platform. We are using SDKs, we are using tool chains, we are using libraries for the target platform. Once all that happens, my keys are blank. Once the, all that happens, you get into Kimu and you run the software as the target platform. But what changed? You are in Kimu now. So the target platform is here. And that's where the magic happens, where m when you are executing software, you're executing as you are in the target platform. How does that happen? Let's see. So 
when Kumu, Kumu is like the official translator here, when we are running in the ARM world and we are executing our code here, we are giving ARM instruction set to the x86 host and saying like, hey, can you solve this for me? I don't have the compute power enough to do it. So the instruction set goes to x86, translated by Kumu, facilitated, and the x86 machine being more bulky or more resource heavy can do it faster than ARM and also you know, give back the results in no time. So it feels just like just-in-time translation. That's what Kumu does for you. It gives you back the response and the output comes back to you and says like, this is the output of your code. And that's what Kumu does like in a very simplified way. I, I like this because it's very simplified. It doesn't go into the conversation part, which is the extreme tough. Um, how does the translations happen? How do each architecture talks to each other? And I feel like this way, Kumu is able to um, have multiple machines working together on the same system within isolation. No one has to know where the code is coming from. Everyone get their answers and quite fast as well because of the dynamic translation schema support. Looking at a diagram, we can see the hardware, which is your machine or your laptop, and the host OS kernel. This could be your Windows, your Linux, your Mac OS, and that's running Qmu on top with a guest application, whatever that is. And then Qmu here is what we call a type one emulation platform. A type one emulation, sorry, it's a type two uh, emulation platform. KVN is the type. Qmu uh, is the type two emulation platform which doesn't work on the OS layer. It talks to the OS layer in terms of getting the resources it needs. It creates virtual devices. Whereas if you think about on the left side with KVM, KVM is a Linux kernel module. So it does virtualization right on the kernel layer. It doesn't need software emulation. It directly talks to the hardware and it gives you near native performance being a type one emulation platform. So once you use Qmu and KVM together, you can get quite good performance. And that's why everyone recommends just use Qmu and KVM. But I wanted to have these slides together to sort of show like why why are we, you know, trying to say like, okay, just use Qmu with KVM. And that way, you know, it helps around. The, the software runs natively, no one knows what's happening. And it also is very cheap to do because you don't have to ship the entire company, thousands of Raspberry Pis. Everyone can run their own Qmu devices, they can bring back up. And the best of all, it's all performant. Like you're not losing, you're losing a bit of performance, but it's better than thousands of dollars in hardware that you can't even buy. Let's come out for our actual task, which is building this virtual Raspberry Pi. So this is my machine uh, right here. It's a x86 i7 computer with 16 gigs of RAM. This is going to be our host computer today, where we are going to spin up a virtual Raspberry Pi. And here's how a Raspberry Pi looks like. It's all the specs. But with Qmu, the limitation is, and this is the obvious con, is like you can't emulate everything. If that's the case, why would we need hardware at all, right? So Qmu's limitations are very rapidly decreasing. A lot of the hardware that we couldn't emulate five years ago is now emulated. You can even do kernel Linux modules. You can talk to the HDMI, CSI ports with your laptop or whatever system you're using, and you can actually do the work. So thinking about this, this is what our actual list looks like when you are trying to run it with Qmu. You need four cores of compute with one gigs of RAM. You need Wi-Fi pass-through or basically any internet pass-through because Qmu doesn't have Bluetooth and it can't have that. You can do video, you can do audio pass-through as well. And then for storage, you can do whatever you want. And that's what we are going to be building our virtual Raspberry Pi on. Some steps to go before you are building. And I'm trying to go the CLI way this time because I think uh, I heard feedback like a like, lot of people are familiar with the GUI way. So I, I like the CLI way because of the sheer flexibility it offers. So right now we are just checking if your uh, system can support virtualization. So if it has VTX or AMD V cores, then it can support virtualization. If this value is more than zero, then you can be sure that you can actually do uh, run QMU. And the second thing is like, let's also check for KVM, see if this machine supports that and then install the dependencies. That's quite nice. So once you have all this in place, you can start running. And I wanted to put this disclaimer in as well. So if you are new to Qmu and you're just learning, don't, don't go the CLI way because 
it's like the Linux way, right? The Linux administrative way. We always want to do the CLI way. But it's overwhelming. It's too many configuration options. You can get lost in it a little bit. At least with the GUI, you can gain your first step. I feel like the first step is really important in Qemu and the exploration of it. Because once you start breaking the system, then you will learn even better. Like, okay, wh what failed last time over? Because the commands look like this. It's not our fault. It's like how Qemu is, where a lot of flexibility has been offered, where lots of arguments are being used. Um, and we, are go we will go through in this presentation, like what these arguments are and how this actually turns up into an RPI machine. But I just want to start a terminal. Oh, is it here? Ah, there you go. It's coming. So this is the command. I'll leave it running, and we'll go back to our presentation. So this will start the Qemu machine, um, starting our Raspberry Pi. I already downloaded the Raspberry Pi machine, and we can talk about what the commands are. Come on. There you go. We are back. So starting from the top, we are first figuring out what is KVM. We didn't touch a lot about it. KVM is kernel virtual machine. And it's a kernel module baked right into the Linux kernel. So you don't actually need QMO. If you want, you can even run virtual machines or emulate using KVM right in the Linux kernel. And sure, it all quite a bit will depend on hardware emulation, like what hardware you're going to support and what use cases will come out of it. But having QMO plus KVM will get the job done in most of the use cases. So definitely, definitely have KVM enabled. You never know where, wherever the hardware gets accelerated and you can now directly talk to the hardware instead of QMU, where it's more, morely, more of a translation basis. Um, we'll go over an example where we, I am setting up a network and we'll see how QMU does it and how KVM will do it. So, Next thing is machine and CPU. On the second and third line, we are specifying um, machine templates as well. I think it was QMU 6, if I'm not wrong, where they added, you can have machine templates in. So you now you can specify machine and your CPU, like what CPU you have, and then it will sort of govern you. Because if I specify here that I need only two cores, it won't let me. The, uh, the Cortex A A53 only comes with four. So that, that sort of thing, that sort of uh, reliability as well as compatibility can be now guaranteed with QMU. When you're giving it to colleagues, they want to tinker with the commands, but QMU won't let them. So it's, it's good where you can specify a lot more options and a lot more options for the machine as well. The memory, you can specify whatever memory you want, but right now, since we are completely focused on doing a Raspberry Pi emulation, we are going with one gig and four cores. Um, next, we come up with very important for the Raspberry Pi architecture, which is device tree or device tree overlays. And I have extracted mine, but you can also use init RAMFS if you want, or use your own kernel image to boot up whatever you want. So I, I like to always extract the image from where I downloaded and then pull out things I want. It, it is much cleaner that way because that, that way I can use this device tree overlay in multiple times I mess up and I mess up quite a bit. So it's, it's good when you can, you know, do like reproducible builds. And I feel like this part of QMU is what I like, is very similar to how Docker is. You can have reproducible builds even with QMU if you want. And uh, the SD card that we are using as the base media is the Raspberry Pi or Raspbian I just downloaded, which is running in the background now. Next bunch of options is network, which is what I wanted to explain a little bit more. Um, when we are doing network configuration with KVM, you can use something called bridge, uh, what is, what is the package? Bridge utils? I, I think so, yeah. And um, bridge utils, you can create bridge connections between multiple QMU machines. You can also use NAT, which is like, if someone, if a lot of people do host, Docker here, so it's like host networking. Basically, your machine's network connection will be what QMU uses. Um, same everything. And then you can define also, so on line 10, I've decided a port for TCP which is where I can SSH into my QMU machine if I wanted. And that way I can have remote access to my machine as well if my system stays on. And you can specify on line nine what devices you want to connect. So let's say you want a mouse, you want a keyboard connected to your device, so you can specify it here. And that's the flexibility I've been saying, which the CLI gets you. And on line 11, I like to have a no reboot um, because QMU machines are uh, sort of 
not persistent, but they can be if you want them. So if, you, if they shut down, they'll just come back up again. In Docker, as you specify restart policies, you can specify it here as well. No graphic is basically, I just don't want to see Raspbian. Uh, bit of a personal preference. Um, and yeah, this is a very nice thing I found out uh, when I was looking through it, where now Qmu supports quite a bit of Raspberry Pis. And you can just select one. And you don't even have to now specify memory and cores anymore. anymore. I didn't know that. So that was a complete TIL. I thought, like, I'll post it. In. And you got a lot of hardware that Raspberry Pi already has. GPIO, SDMMC, the thermal sensor is also involved. I, I don't know if that was there. Serial ports were always there for Qmu, but they never, they have been quite janky. So it's, it's good that the community is working on it and it's an open source project. We all contribute to it as well. So it's good that Qmu is really advancing into Raspberry Pi boards, but I hope to see like more boards come up as well. So we can, we can emulate and play around with it as well. But that's the command, that's how you run. And on the background, we must have the machine on. So I'll just zoom in you, so you can see. And uh, I, I trust you folks, so. No, the password, the password shouldn't be shown, no worries. It's, it's Raspberry Pi, no worries. Raspbian is not the most secure. But yeah, here you go. In one minute, we are inside a complete Raspberry Pi device. You can use this device as a build machine, as a dev machine, to build your software to you know, use it as your CI CD environment. But I, I understand like there are better tools for it. I would say you can use it with Docker as Marcus was always telling me. Um, lot of things involved, but I wanted to sort of take one single example here, what Kimu can do to sort of help you around just starting as an on-ramp topic. And we are barely scratching the surface here. Like there's a lot of things to go around. Let me bring back the presentation. Kimu can do lots of things now. I'm, I, I'm really exciting because I have been using Kimu for our own personal thing, but I've been looking in the new version. You can do something called, I think th this has been around quite a bit, but I didn't know it was called Spice out of all things. You can just copy and paste uh, things from your guest ecosystem to the host. You can do USB pass-through. You can mount file systems as well. Snapshots has been always around, but I think they're also improving it to support better compression. So you can have like way more snapshots than you were in the past and lots more things to experiment with Kimu these days. So something I hope like with this introduction, you can actually go into your own use case and start up your own machine. Like the first time you start up the machine, it's, it's really nice. It's like starting up your own Docker container, but you don't get the feel because it's like one command. This is actually makes you work for it. So this is, so this is, this is the session, right? But this is my favorite thing to do on every talk. How do I use it at work? A lot of people, I, I see like, they don't cover the practical bits. And I, I like to really think about like, hey, how do I use Qmu, right? So, very good question, whoever asked that. Um, we use it for, th this, this example of me just doing like silly drawings is why I like this slides the most. So basically you uh, do like resource segmentation if you're working in a data center job or you are with Google, Azure, AWS, um, any one of the you know, big cloud companies, you already know virtual machines are everywhere where they are segmenting off like big processors to sell off the compute capacity to different people. Uh, someone needs a lot of storage, so they get two cores, a lot of storage. If they need more GPU, oh, that's also very nice. We'll come back to it. Uh, GPU emulation has become really good. I actually saw some videos where someone, four people were playing on the single 490, 1490. I don't know how they did it, but it was really bad five years ago. So it was something that uh, cloud companies also do, where they divide the uh, what H100s between a lot of customers and they give the compute capacity to the people who buy it. You can use it for disaster recovery as well. Quite nice when you mess up a data migration or maybe you are looking for some new, maybe, maybe you are upgrading your Kubernetes version, right? You might want to check or your OS for your devices, you might want to check like if it all works correctly. Training and research and employee desktop virtualization is quite big in enterprises where a lot of the employees get like part of the compute, but they are not hooked up to like their own computers. It's like one central server in the entire building running it. And that's all virtualization, that's all chemo. Um, using processors like these and just cutting off course 
to whoever needs it. If someone needs more cores, there you go. Um, oh, I think I did some animation, I was like add more virtual machines. But the next example is my favorite, how QMU can be used for CI CD pipelines, which is a lot of people have been using when they want to build and test their software. So it's like, let's say you, let's say we want to do VS code for Raspbian. How do we know it really works? It's all good in paper when I say in the AMD presentation, it was uh, you, you build, you write your code for the target platform, you, you choose the libraries for the target platform, but humans can't be trusted. We, um, we have to have tests, we have to have code to you know, sort of tell us like, okay, yeah, it actually works on the platform. So at Bellina, we solve this problem in a different way with, with hardware in the loop. But if you don't have hardware on hand, you can obviously use Kimo and it's like really effective because you're no, not losing any bit of performance and you're also gaining test advantage where you're not releasing as fast as possible, but as confidently as possible. And in IoT, that means like, that really means a thing. Because if you ship a bad release, you're like stranding hundreds of Raspberry Pis in the desert somewhere. It's, it's, it's as easy. So we have a responsibility and I feel like testing could be nice. Hardware prototyping is also a very nice one. Um, where let's say your team, your hard, you are working a hard tech project and your hardware team is deciding on a hardware piece, but the requirements are clear you can use QMU to emulate that particular architecture and at least start building the software, start building tests, maybe help them around. And then uh, because hardware is like so tough to iterate on and it's so expensive as well, it might change, but at least you have QMU to be flexible on. As a software engineering team working with a hardware team in, at Bellina, flexibility is everything in this game. So I, I really like how QMU can actually help you emulate complete machines nowadays and use all of it. So your code is like almost 99% there. And then when the hardware comes, you can do the final touches. You can solve the race conditions. You can figure out, yeah, there you go. The, the race conditions have been quite bad. Um, but yeah, lo lots of things when the hardware comes, it messes up. QMU is not the silver bullet, right? Ho hope everyone can get that from the presentation. It's like the best effort, but it's, it's better than the company going bankrupt because you didn't have Raspberry Pis. Next. The potato computer, I like this. So yeah, you can play, I, I always love QMU or just KVM for emulation, but I use it at my home KVM switches. Uh, has anyone ever tried like using two, com like bridging two computers together using a KVM switch? Pretty cool, pretty nice thing to have. Like if you have two laptops, you can have a KVM switch in between and both machines will share data, peripherals, connected devices, everything because of hardware virtualization. Once you figure out what KVM is, what QMU is, then you can actually start seeing use cases everywhere. More than IoT, it has been really nice building this presentation because I've been looking into it and then penetration testing, malware testing as well, closed box so that your computer stays, like your host system stays separate in an isolated environment. You can also do stress testing, which we do quite a bit at Bellina um, because you can really push QMU machines and see when the host OS will give a risk condition in a completely isolated environment because you're also winning a silicon lottery when you're getting a Raspberry Pi. It's a small chance, right? So some Raspberry Pi will be better than some other Raspberry Pi, just a little bit. And that creates problems. You have to account for that in IoT. So we do a lot of stress testing as well, uh, fun stuff. And then the last one is like you can now, you know, you start using your legacy systems. Uh, quite a bit, which is what Linux offers, but now you can use virtualization for it as well. And just, just as a last slide, I've been mentioning Bellina quite a bit. It, this is basically the product I work on. Um, we use QMU. That, that last thing is QMU basically, just think about it. I didn't change the diagram, but we basically have a hardware in the loop testing policy at Bellina. So every operating system that gets built, we test it on actual hardware. But imagine, you know, like you're in 2021, IoT company doesn't have hardware. So we, we built our own QMU worker and that's why I'm here giving this talk. We experimented quite a bit and we settled on QMU to fulfill our testing needs. And I think that's like very helpful for anyone who's into development or testing of their devices on a cross-platform requirement where you can actually include um, real test pieces into E2E for creating like a software in the loop. So your feedback process is as good as possible. You know, you're as close as possible to the truth. Nothing goes by you. And once you're in the hardware place, sure, contact, 
contact me. I'm, I'm happy to help. We are, we are doing something open source in this thing. But hardware in the loop also gets you as close as possible to the truth, where you don't want to have devices failing in the field, right? This is what protects you against it. Quick summary. Kimu is not a Pokemon. It requires things to break, to learn. You can near natively emulate hardware and you can do it very well with the advancements that happened in Kimu. Definitely go back and try it. Um, I'm going back and trying it. Like I have been doing Docker for now three years nonstop. So I'm really looking forward to like just going back into Kimu and like changing some things up because before Docker, it was Kimu for all of us. Um, and then Docker came and then a lot of other things also came. So it's good uh, that it's coming back and it's also very nice. Quite extensive features, quite extensive use cases that it can have, as I told you. And yeah, you can also be a master chef. There you go. That's the talk. Ah, one, one last thing. So the, the cheesecake thing is there. So if someone is, someone is from Bilbao and can recommend a cheesecake, that's open. But uh, what I do for every talk of mine is I, like, slides are here, scan this, but it also has a feedback form, completely optional. If you don't want to fill it, just press submit and you can get the slides because I wanted to create the slides in a way where it can actually help me out. I self-document quite a bit. So next time I want to run Qmu, I'm looking at my slides um, and I hope that that helps you as well. I'm actually updating these slides all today because I'm, as I'm learning new things, I have to update it for snapshotting as well which is something I wanted to cover, but right now I'm already six minutes late, I think. So yeah, that's the presentation. I'll open it to questions now. How, how are the jokes? <laughs> good, good. I didn't sleep today. <laughs> um, one question would be, do you have any experience with actually adding custom peripherals to the QEMO? Because, I mean, I, I really would be curious if you have any experience in that, how, how hard is it to actually mm -hmm. get some additional, like, simple hardware added there, which is not yet so supported off the shelf from QEMO? For me, it's like the question comes up as um, hardware, hardware is rarely simple. Like, even the simplest thing, right? So, um, we have had to add a custom piece of board like get supported on Kimu, uh, the team worked on it, but I didn't personally look into it. So yeah, uh, we can get in touch and I can, I can definitely help because Bellina is like quite open in that regard, happy to help out the community, but it is hard because once you're talking on the layers of translating between OSS and between architectures, it becomes a bit too, you know, in the, in the segment of like, I don't know what's going on. Like, how are they talking? And uh, sure, it's all open source, it's all out there, but um, once we get into device support or peripheral support into Qmu, like by default, like how Qmu has done it for Raspberry Pi, I'm not really sure, because even I was surprised, like that list has grown. It, it didn't exist when I last used it. <laughs> so um, I'm also looking forward to seeing like if we can get some of our devices supported as well. Balina used to do some devices. So we are looking forward to seeing if we can also use Qmu and our devices can be natively supported. Yeah, thanks. That's a great question. No worries. This is this is better. You can get free for break. <laughs> Perfect. Hope that's it. Thank you.